I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the first in what will be an annual series of lectures on public policy which has been endowed at the Institute. After the lecture, there will be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall. Today, our speaker is Lakdar Brahimi, who is currently a director's visitor here at the Institute. Mr. Brahimi was educated in Algeria and France. During Algeria's struggle for independence, he was the representative of the National Liberation Front in Southeast Asia. Subsequently, he served as his, successively as his country's ambassador to Egypt and the Sudan, his ambassador to, to the United Kingdom, diplomatic advisor to the President of Algeria, Under Secretary General of the League of Arab States, and from 1991 to 93, Minister for Foreign Affairs. He also served as Special Representative for the Secur Secretary General of the United Nations in South Africa in 1993 and 94 in Haiti uh, from 1994 to 1996, as well as undertaking special missions in many other countries. He was the Secretary General's Special Envoy in Afghanistan from July 1997 to October 1999. In 2000, he chaired an independent panel established by the Secretary General Kofi Annan on UN peace operations, which produced the Brahimi Report. He presided over the UN Bonn Conference on Afghanistan at the end of 2001, which produced the peace agreement known as the Bonn Process, and went on to oversee its implementation as head of the UN Assistance Mission for Afghanistan in Kabul during 2003 and 2004. Today, Lakdar Brahimi's subject is Afghanistan and Iraq, failed wars or failed states. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor, and I'm very grateful to you, uh, Director, for your very, very kind words. Please allow me, first of all, to say how grateful I am to Dr. Peter Goddard and the Institute for Advanced Studies for the unique opportunity they gave me of being here at this most prestigious academic institution. I am also indebted to Professor John Scott and her colleagues at the School of Social Science for accepting me amongst them. I am learning much from their seminars and the discussions I have had with them, as well as with other members from the other schools. The scholarly presentations and debates I have had the privilege to attend have been consistently stimulating and have on more than one occasion helped me see even situations and problems I thought I was familiar with and their new angles. I am all at once immensely honored, flattered, and intimidated to deliver the first lecture in this series. For people of my cultural and professional background, academia inspires genuine and profound feelings of respect and admiration. It also inspires a certain feeling of nervousness because the world of politics and diplomacy I come from is aware that scholars are forever scrutinizing what we do and say and quick to see and publicize our far two frequent failings. As I am no longer an active member of the Fraternity of Diplomats and Politicians, I am speaking on behalf of no government and no international organization. I am freer to speak out, but cannot claim any authority for my pronouncements. I gain in freedom, and I lose in authority. <laughs> After 25 years of coup d'etat, Soviet occupation and civil wars, Afghanistan was largely a failed state in the last quarter of 2001, when immediately after 9-11, the Taliban administration was routed by the US military intervention and the United Nations brokered the peace process for Afghanistan at the Bonn Conference. Today, after a successful initial phase which went some way towards the restoration of peace and stability, 
Afghanistan is again struggling with its old demons of internal strife. The Taliban, as well as other enemies of the new Afghan state and its international backers, are seriously threatening the modest achievements and fragile institutions which had emerged in the course of the last five years. Iraq, on the other hand, at the end of the 1970s, was considered one of the few countries in the third world on the verge of economic takeoff. Its chances of joining the club of dragons and tigers in Asia were rated higher than those of India and China. Two disastrous wars and 13 years of crippling UN sanctions annihilated that dream. And now, foreign invasion and occupation have destroyed the state. The new Iraqi leaders, who for the most part returned from exile behind the tanks of the invader, and their pro foreign protectors have failed to rebuild credible state institutions or provide even the most basic of services to their people. Total chaos rules supreme, and Iraq has become the scene of a savage civil war and a growing menace to peace and stability in the whole region. The confident promise of four years ago that Iraq shall be made into a shining model of peace, democracy, and prosperity is all but forgotten. When I was in Afghanistan in 2002 and 2003, I used to argue that no comparison between Iraq and Afghanistan was justified. Here is, on the one hand, a country torn by internal strife that allowed its territory to be used as a basis to plan, train for, and launch a massive attack on the United States that resulted in the death of 3,000 innocent people. What is more, that attack had come after several others and after repeated warnings to the Taliban that terrorist attacks by their honored guests, as they called Osama bin Laden and his associates, attacks on the life and property in other countries would not be tolerated. Even after 9-11, the Taliban were told that if the perpetrators were handed over to justice in the United States or, other, or even another country, there will be no further consequences for them. The Taliban rejected all these appeals, even when they came from their closest friends. Consequently, America's war on the Taliban was accepted as legitimate by the United Nations and all its members. And it was met with understanding and in many cases with support practically everywhere in the world. Furthermore, in 2002 and 2003, the agreement in, of Bonn for Afghanistan under the auspices of the United Nations seemed to be working, despite many difficulties, mistakes, and concerns. The Afghans themselves were rather hopeful and on the whole supportive, whereas the rest of the world was generally satisfied with what was being done. In Iraq, on the other hand, it was an entirely different story. Public opinion the world over overwhelmingly did not accept the logic behind the war. Even the main partners of President Bush in the Iraqi adventure, Prime Ministers Blair, Aznar, Berlusconi, and Kuzumi, could not win the support of the majority of their respective people. Indeed, for many, Iraq looked very much like an anachronistic colonial enterprise that obviously could simply not be compared to Afghanistan. Yet today, a little more than five years after Bonn and four years after the invasion of Iraq, there is much that is similar in the two situations. Iraq has ev evolved even worse than the most pessimistic had predicted. Whereas Afghanistan has, in the course of the last two years, but especially in 2006, dangerously slipped back into a conflict. Afghanistan and Iraq are now a sort of Siamese twins, joined to one another by Iran, US presence, and Al-Qaeda. Things are bad in Iraq, and they are getting bad in Afghanistan, to a point where, even in the West, Fear is now expressed that the U.S. and its allies 
may end up losing in both countries. What I want to propose today is not a scholarly comparative study of the problems in Afghanistan and Iraq. All I can offer is a simple, factual narration, mostly a personal testimony, born mainly out of the time I spent working in and on Afghanistan, and from those few weeks in, 19, to, uh, in 2004, during which I allowed myself to be dragged into Iraq. I shall speak more of the past, the recent past, than of the future. Like most observers, I firmly believe that there was no fatality that the situation in either Afghanistan or Iraq should be in the sorry state it is in. If things have gone so tragically bad, if Afghanistan is now threatened with the prospect of falling back into the conflicts of pre-9-11 days, if the Iraqi state has all but disappeared and the country is fast sinking into, into, into chaos, it is because much of the hopes raised have been betrayed much of the promises made have not been kept, and all in all, grave mistakes have been committed again and again, especially in Iraq. The obvious question to ask is a very simple one. Why is all this happening? Why, in the case of, of, of Afghanistan, was the initial success not sustained? To try and find an answer, we will have to speak of those on whom the future depends. The Afghan government of Hamid Karzai, the Taliban, Pakistan, and of course the United States. In this connection, I cannot resist the temptation to quote a couple of sentences from, um, a, a couple of sentences about the first British war in Afghanistan from an article published in the last issue of Foreign Affairs for the year 2001, and probably written at about the time the United States started its bombing campaign in Afghanistan, while the United Nations, in the United Nations, preparations were being made for the Bonn Conference. Here is what Milton Bearden, a former CIA field officer, had to say about that British war on Afghanistan in 1839-1842. I quote, according to the, to the late Louis Dupré, the premier historian of Afghanistan, four factors contributed to the British disaster. Let me show you a map of Afghanistan. I think, uh, that, that's all the show there is. You know. I'm, I'm, as somebody said, I'm a reader, not a, a PowerPointer. Um, according to Louis Dupré, four factors contributed to the British disaster. The occupation of Afghan territory by foreign troops, the placing of an unpopular emir on the throne, the harsh acts of the British-supported Afghans against their local enemies, and the reduction of the subsidies paid to the tribal chiefs by British political agents. The British would repeat these mistakes in the Second Afghan War of 1878-1881, as would the Soviets a century later. The United States would be wise to consider them today." End of quote. Um, <coughs> in, it is a fact that all four factors would you pray so in connection with Britain's experience in Afghanistan in the 19th century are at work again. The foreigners, with or without forces, are there. The emirs, or governance, as we would say today, are once again a problem. Harsh acts are inflicted on the people of Afghanistan by the foreigners as well as by the Afghans who enjoy their support. And subsidies, in the form of international aid, as we say today, have been promised and not provided and paid in full or on time. We shall speak a little bit of these factors as we go along. On Iraq, uh, my thunder has been stolen these past few weeks by the new Democratic Congress in Washington. 
and by some excellent articles and documentaries produced to mark the beginning of the fifth year in the life of this war. But I hope there may be a few points which uh, we could usefully make. I shall, on uh, Iraq, articulate uh, my uh, remarks around two, two, two points. The first one is, is a question which is, why did the United States invade Iraq in the first place? Maybe I am uh, naive or stupid or both to be asking this question four years after uh, the war started. But I do confess that I have not heard one satisfactory answer to this basic question. The second issue is related to a paradox. And here, let me tell you a little story. Not very long ago, I met a, a very distinguished former British diplomat who told me a story about one of his professors in Cambridge. Uh, I hasten to say it's not our director, uh, because our director is a mathematician, and this concerns some people who are interested in Greek and Latin. Uh, this professor, according to my diplomat friend, when he was himself a student, was writing his uh, 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 dissertation and had almost completed it when he read in a journal an article where, you know, it's a terrible coincidence, but all the arguments he was developing were in that article. So we said, you know, we asked our diplomat friend, what did he do? He said he took a hot bath. <laughs> Apparently that's what they do in Cambridge, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but in, 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 in that bath, I think he said, okay, I'm going to develop exactly the opposite arguments that I have been, I was trying to develop. And he did that, and it worked, and he got his PhD and became professor. <laughs> now, as I was you know, thinking about Iraq, every time I thought of something, then I read somewhere or heard somebody say exactly the same thing. So I said, I will do like you know, the professor. But then when I thought of anything contrary to what I had been thinking, I found that somebody had said it too. <laughs> because on Iraq, Everything and its opposite has been said and is being said. Um, but the paradox is, um, with all the books, the articles, the films that you will see, I suggest to you that in the United States and to a lesser degree in Britain, people have stopped talking about um, the, the political debate, has stopped, to be, uh, stopped being about Iraq. The Americans, and to a lesser degree the British, by going into Iraq, have created problems for themselves that give them no time anymore to think about Iraq. They are now, that when they speak about Iraq, they are really talking about themselves. This is a terrible paradox. And you know, I think in, uh, not only the mathematicians, but everybody else in this institute knows that uh, you can't solve a problem if you don't talk about it. Um, and this, do, therefore, raises all sorts of questions, as we will see. The first being, if the reasons for the war are not known, if, in addition, the debate is not about Iraq anymore, how, then, will the problems created by this war in Iraq for the Iraqi people will ever be solved? Let's start, then, with Afghanistan. At the end of uh, the year 2000, Mrs. Sadako Ogata, made her last field visit as High Commissioner for Refugees to Afghanistan. She noted with much sadness that the world had lost interest in Afghanistan, and she wondered what was going to become of its people in general and of the millions of refugees in particular. Her question echoed some of my own anxieties just over one year earlier when I resigned in frustration as Special Envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations for Afghanistan. Afghanistan had been of central importance when, the, when its people were fighting and making sacrifices against the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet troops were driven out, interest in Afghanistan diminished after the implosion of the Soviet Union 
the international community turned its back completely on Afghanistan because the international community has no time for a small, destitute, faraway country with no strong support from the countries that count the United Nations peacekeeping, peacemaking efforts of the kind I was uh, involved in were largely a waste of time. When in September of 1999, after I resigned, I appeared before the Security Council to explain the reasons of my resignation. I warned that conflict cannot be contained forever within the borders of one country. Even if that country is so poor, so far away, and all in all, as unimportant as Afghanistan, the conflict shall inevitably spill over and may very well affect people very far away from its borders. I was listened to politely, but I don't think I was heard. The events of the 11th of September 2001, two years later, changed all that. If evidence were needed that in today's world, the international agenda is almost exclusively, um, the, the agenda is set almost exclusively by the United States, it's enough to recall how all of a sudden, after 9-11, Afghanistan became a very important country for the rest of the world. Journalists rushed in in their thousands. UN agencies and international NGOs followed suit, ready to rush into Afghanistan as soon as one way or another it became safe to do so. In New York, we were literally mobbed by foreign ministers, ambassadors, and prime ministers and heads of states and the press was also after us all the time, as Barney Rubin found out uh, to his sorrow uh, in those days, and he may tell you this story later on. The uh, press was also after us all the time, and when we went to Bonn, 700 journalists came and waited on a boat uh, very patiently for us to finish and uh, be kind enough to talk to them. The Bonn conference lasted only nine days. Uh, nine days and most of nine nights, because I don't think we slept a lot in, in, during that time. But on the 5th of December, the Bonn agreement was signed and the government headed by Hamid Karzai formed. The agreement provided for a comprehensive and credible roadmap to progressively bring peace, stability, and some development to Afghanistan. Uh, what has been achieved since then is not negligible. Very briefly, Afghanistan is now dotted with a constitution which I believe is fairly well accepted by its people. Presidential and parliamentary elections were held and have produced institutions that are also accepted as legitimate by the majority of the Afghans. Some improvement in the social situation has taken place. I was recently told that almost 80% of the people of Afghanistan have access to some kind of basic health service. If this is true, it is really remarkable. And there are the schools, the women in parliament, the new currency that was uh, successfully launched, and some uh, uh, economic activity. All in all, this was real, though very modest progress, but the important thing to remember is that none of all this is irreversible. Unless security improves all over the country, unless the present upsurge in violence by the Taliban and others is convincingly contained and reversed, all the gains that have been made may be undone. Especially that, parallel to the modest achievements made, there is more that has happened that is dangerously negative. Corruption has invaded all official institutions at all levels. It is unanimously agreed that Hamid Karzai himself is not corrupt, but it is also said that corruption is surrounding him from all sides, including in the presidential palace. The rule of law is at best an aspiration for most Afghans, not a reality. Far too many people have placed themselves successfully outside or above the law, 
ordinary Afghans simply cannot take it for granted that those in authority will respect their rights, their property, or even their personal dignity. One of the biggest failings in the implementation of the Bonn process is the poor achievement in national reconciliation. Afghanistan had been the scene of all sorts of conflicts for 25 years. A patient and persistent effort was and is still needed to heal the wounds Afghans inflicted on one another. But not much has been done, unfortunately. In particular, the government and even more so its international partners have not looked as closely as they should have to the Taliban problem. On this a little bit more, uh, more a little bit later. President Karzai was the obvious choice in Bonn and he has performed well. He comes from a we very well-known family and an important tribe. He is honest, humble and articulate. He is an Afghan patriot, a good Muslim, proud to be a Pashtun, but genuinely above all ethnic and sectarian bias. He is also still relatively young, handsome, and he dresses well. These things have never done any harm to someone who aspires to be the leader of his nation. I think that the president knows, however, that there is much disappointment up and down the country and that some, indeed more and more, of this blame is now put on him personally. People blame him not only for what he or his government have done or failed to do, but also for what the international community, in particular the United States, do or fail to do. People expect a lot from their president, and this is normal even if it does put an almost unbearable burden on his shoulders. President Karzai knows, I believe, that it is high time that he does what it takes to improve his image and work hard to make himself a better emir than the one picked by the British in 1839. His international partners, the United States in particular, who are unanimous in saying that he is irreplaceable must join hands with him and with each other to help him restore his prestige and authority. Before 9-11, before Bonn, before Karzai, there was another emir who actually gave himself or was given the title of Amir al-Mu'minin, or leader of the faithful. That is Muhammad Omar, the Taliban supreme leader. The Taliban movement literally erupted on the Afghan chaotic scene after the seven factions who fought the Russians took over the government and soon provided, uh, proved themselves to be utterly incompetent, selfish, corrupt, and viciously cruel in their dealings with their people and with one another. The Taliban took Kandahar in the south in 1994 and launched from there a series of successful raids on the main cities of the country. Two years later, Herat, Jalalabad, and Kabul itself had fallen to them. It is sometimes said that the Taliban movement was created in Pakistan, by Pakistan, for Pakistan. I think this is slightly um, exaggerated because the situation is more complex. The Taliban movement is a genuine Afghan, more narrowly Pashtun phenomenon. Its main leaders participated in the jihad against Soviet Union. Many of them uh, belong to the jihad, one jihadi group in particular, that of uh, Mulawi Khalis. <coughs> and many of them, though not all, studied in Pakistani madrasas and were influenced by the Deobandi rigorous school of Islam, which developed in India in the 19th century. The Taliban movement was, in a sense, a revolt by the second ranks against the despicable behavior of their elders. For example, or, uh, one example of what uh, these uh, leaders did, uh, they literally took turns at shelling Kabul and destroying it, whereas the communists and the 
Soviet Union had left it intact. The Taliban had very strong links with various Pakistani religious and political organizations, as well as with ISI, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, intelligence organization of the Pakistani army. But the Taliban were first and foremost, let's say it again, an Afghan organization, and at the time of their original surge, they reflected genuine feelings of popular disenchantment with the post-Soviet regime in their country. The Taliban established, however, an extremely, an, 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 an extremely harsh and intolerant regime that was unprecedented in Afghanistan, a country of religious conservatism and tribal traditions, but with relative tolerance. I don't think that anyone before the Taliban thought that hospitals should not be accessible to women or that listening to music, trimming one's own beard, or flying a kite would land one in prison or worse. But the Taliban did provide security and their government was free of corruption. One of their most remarkable achievements was, in the last year of their rule, the near total eradication of opium poppy cultivation. Um, it is generally believed that they did it because they had accumulated a large stock of opium and that prices had fallen. The assumption is that they, had they stayed in power, they would have restarted planting uh, uh, opium again. However, I think the people who have succeeded them have got to recognize that they knew how to do it, whereas the people of today don't seem to know how to do it. The Taliban were divided on the issue of the so-called Arab Afghans, and on is Osama bin Laden in particular. It is a fact that Osama bin Laden did not come back uh, to uh, Afghanistan uh, in the days of the Taliban. He came to Afghanistan before that, and the Taliban used to remind us always that they inherited him. But once they have inherited him, they did very well by him. Um, there is little doubt that strong personal relations developed between Mullah Omar, uh, the supreme leader of the Taliban, and Bin Laden. Some speak of family bonds between the two through arranged mar uh, marriages. And as an example of uh, the influence that uh, they had, um, I met uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar, uh, I think for the second time, in September of 1998, just after the Taliban had taken the north, including Bamiyan, and stories were going around that they wanted to destroy those um, Buddhas in, in Bamiyan. Um, I, I told Mullah Muhammad Omar that they shouldn't do that, and he told me, and these are his words, uh, nobody will go anywhere near the Buddhas because they are part of our national heritage. Yet, the same Mullah Muhammad Omar later ordered the Buddhas destroyed and ignored all the pleas from all corners of the world, including from his Pakistani friends. And people believe that uh, this change of mind uh, was caused by the influence Bin Laden and Zawahiri acquired on him. Um, now, when the Taliban were routed by the US bombing campaign, not many people Afghans or foreign, gave much thought to what had happened to them. When later, under the present dispensation, a bomb went off somewhere in Kabul or elsewhere, or a rocket was fired, these incidents were, at the beginning, very isolated and far between, were attributed to, quote, the remnants of the Taliban. And it was left at that. Some questions were raised about the Taliban, including in one or two reports of the Secretary General of the United Nations to the Security Council. But I think everyone was satisfied that Afghanistan had seen the last of the Taliban uh, and that uh, they, uh, they will not uh, come back again. But uh, we now realize, and we should have realized much earlier, that the Taliban had succumbed to superior power, but 
uh, in typical Afghan fashion, they were determined to come back and fight again. Now let's speak about some of the foreigners. We can't speak about all of them because there are too many of them in Afghanistan. But let's speak about two, two important foreigners, uh, uh, Pakistan and, and, and the Americans. For Afghanistan, Pakistan was and still is in a league of its own. Ethnic affinities, a long, very, very long and disputed border, as you can see, uh, uh, constant Pakistani concern about what they call strategic depth add up to a very uneasy relationship at the best of times. Ever since it was created after the partition of India, Pakistan was unhappy with the state of its relations with every government in Kabul except that of the Taliban. For the first time ever, there was, with the Taliban in Kabul, a regime that was not only friendly to Pakistan, but also hostile to India. Naturally, Pakistan would want that regime to flourish, and they would go almost to any length to help it stay in power. And they were doing very well until 9-11, forced Pakistan to choose the Taliban or the United States. They reluctantly said they will choose Washington. Uh, you have a lot of people who will tell you they were not sincere, uh, but that is another story. The fact is that after the fall of the Taliban, the holders of key positions in President Karzai government went out of their way to ignore or provoke Pakistan, while at the same time helping India to reestablish itself in Afghanistan as a favored friend and ally. To say that the news from Kabul worried the Pakistani government would be an understatement. Predictably, some Pakistani would, some, some in Pakistan would think of turning again to the Taliban and support them, perhaps even encourage them to revive their activities in Afghanistan. Predictably, too, the Pakistani establishment would be careful to create conditions of deniability for their activities. How much support is Pakistan providing the resurgent Taliban? Insurrection may be a matter of debate. What is absolutely certain is that the Taliban have in Pakistan a very useful sanctuary, a place to run back to for safety, a pool of young Afghans and Pakistanis in the refugee camps and in the madrasas to recruit from, facilities to plan, train, collect funds, and political and religious organizations who do not hide their sympathies for the Taliban and their hostilities to the present Afghan government and its international backers. Um, the second foreigner, the United States, is um, When they came back to, 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 to Afghanistan, I think they made absolutely no uh, mystery of the fact that what they were interested in was what they called the war on terror. And the place of choice, and I think this is important to remember, to fight this war on terror was not Afghanistan for the people in Washington. It was Iraq, right from the beginning. For key policymakers and influential advisors in Washington, Afghanistan was a distraction. There was intense activity on Afghanistan in the State Department. One presumes that there was also intense activity at the Pentagon, but it is certain that many meetings were held there in the Pentagon, not on Afghanistan, but on Iraq. Maybe as early as the 12th of September, certainly on the 17th. And attention continued to be concentrated on Iraq even after the decision to go to war in Afghanistan had been taken. In fact, the United States would have been much happier if the Taliban had cooperated and hand handed over Bin Laden and his associates. They didn't 
even have to hand them over to the United States. A third friendly country in the Arab world or in Europe would have been just as acceptable. The Taliban did not cooperate. Military action became necessary. But Afghanistan would be no more than a punitive expedition, which should be over in a matter of weeks, uh, a few months at, at, at the outside. Kabul will be a stopover on the way to Baghdad. And so when the United States did decide to use force in Afghanistan, they set for themselves clear but strictly limited objectives. A, this was the beginning of the war on terror, as I said. B, the US was after the perpetrators of those terrorist attacks in New York and Washington. The US will also punish the Taliban because they have chosen to be the allies of the Taliban. However, C, Washington remained faithful to the commitment of President Bush during the election campaign that the United States does not do nation building. Consequently, what would happen to and in Afghanistan once Al-Qaeda had been wiped out, its leaders eliminated, and the Taliban regime brought down would not be, of, would not be the primary responsibility of the United States. America might help, but the UN should take the lead there. This had several consequences, many of them negative. For example, the US would work with whoever was capable and willing to help them hunt down Bin Laden. Whether that would help or hinder the peace process in Afghanistan was not of primary concern to them. The US armed, funded, not only the Northern Alliance factions, but all sorts of characters up and down Afghanistan. Some of these characters did exactly like, and sometimes even worse, than the British-supported Afghans did against their local enemies. Not only did they use the weapons and funds received from the US to torment their enemies, but they sometimes managed to have the US Air Force bomb the villages of their enemies, claiming that Al-Qaeda leaders were there. Again, when the United Nations and others started asking for the expansion of ISAF, ISAF was the internationally mandated multinational force uh, that was only in Kabul. Uh, immediately we arrived in Kabul, we saw that not only it would be safe, but immensely useful if ISAF were expanded out of Kabul. And the Security Council had told us that they would do so if we asked, but they never did. And the Americans, I think, were instrumental in this refusal because they didn't want to have two international armies functioning in the territory. They wanted only their army to be running uh, after Bin Laden and company. And I suppose they must have told themselves that you know, this is not going to last very, young, very long. When we finish, then we can talk about expanding uh, ISAF. Uh, but of course, they, they, they realized that um, uh, you know, uh, Bin Laden and company were a little bit more difficult to get than they thought they would be. And that, uh, 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 you know, enduring freedom, their operation was going to go on for a long time. It is one year and a half, really, after uh, uh, we now know for a fact that it is by the middle of the year 2003 that the Americans uh, understood that they were going to stay there for a long time. One. Two, um, running after uh, Bin Laden will continue, of course, but this was not going to solve the problem of international terrorism in Pakistan and, and, uh, and Afghanistan. To solve the problem of international terrorism, you had to fix Afghanistan, and therefore you had to do nation building. Um, now a little bit uh, faster forward. Uh, the recent visit, not very long ago, of Vice President Dick Cheney to Istanbul and Kabul seems to indicate that the United States is now paying more attention to the problems 
posed by the Taliban inside Afghanistan and to the role allegedly played by the Pakistani government or some people in Pakistan. It is very regrettable that the question of uh, a possible return of the Taliban was not taken seriously much earlier. It was naturally impossible to invite them to Bonn, but the second best thing should have been a consistent effort to engage them after the Bonn conference and to in integrate as many of them as possible into the political process. The idea had been floated, but it was firmly rejected by almost everyone. The factional representatives in the Afghan government, the United States, Russia, Iran, India, nobody wanted to talk to the Taliban. Now, the morale of the Taliban has naturally been boosted by Iraq. There are speculations that direct close links have been established between the Taliban and some Iraqi insurgent groups, maybe through Al-Qaeda. It is certain that the invasion of Iraq was itself a great help to the Taliban. From the day they were attacked in 2001, the Taliban tried to mobilize support by saying, this is an attack against Islam, this is a crusade. It is like the British in the 19th century. It's like the Russians in, the 19, in 1980. But their appeals did not make much of an impression at the time. However, when Iraq was invaded, a lot of young Afghans and Pakistanis started listening. So maybe this is a crusade. Maybe this is an, an attack against Islam. And when the insurgency in Iraq started to be a serious problem, and effective against the United States. The Taliban propaganda did even better. Iraq's population is about equal to that of Afghanistan. And Iraq is mostly a flat desert. If the Iraqis can do so well, say the Taliban, against 150,000 soldiers, why should we not, the Afghans, do even better against 20,000? Be that as it may, what should be done now? There is, I think, a consensus amongst Afghan leaders and their international partners about what needs to be done at the level of governance as well as in the field of development. The right man, the right place in the administration, more generous resources from donors, and a more efficient system of implementing development and reconstruction projects. I know that it's easier said than done, but you know, we are in uh, Princeton and the Institute, we are not in Kabul, so we can say things and leave it to others to implement them. Uh, but the serious challenge is security. And security raises the question of what is to be done with and or about the Taliban. The Secretary General of NATO said several times that NATO forces cannot solve through military means, uh, the, um, uh, Afghan, uh, the, the, the political issues in, in, in Afghanistan. In 2003 and 2004, even in 2005, I was inclined to believe that the United Nations might take the lead to establish contacts with the Taliban, at least with those of them who may be willing to consider being integrated into the political process. I have not been close enough to the ground realities in 2006, and that happens to be the year when the Taliban new surge has picked up. Um, the Taliban now feel they can win. They are convinced that the United States and NATO have no staying power, that they shall give up and leave, and that that shall happen sooner rather than later. President Karzai insists that the Taliban and more generally the acute security situations which exists in the south and east of the country comes exclusively from Pakistan and that therefore the problem can be solved by Pakistan in Pakistan. This is not realistic and it's not correct. Uh, it's not realistic, it's not correct because the problem exists inside Afghanistan, 
it is generated in Afghanistan, even if it is, if there is a lot of help from Pakistan. <laughs> the second thing is, if Pakistan, and this is, this is a reality of history, geography, whatever you want, if Pakistan doesn't want peace in Afghanistan, there shall be no peace in Afghanistan. And Pakistan does have legitimate interests and concerns. Those should be clearly established and addressed. Both India and Pakistan must agree not to use the territory or the people of Afghanistan against one another. And the US, together with the United Nations, the European Union, and the countries that are most actively engaged in Afghanistan, should patiently but firmly bring all these parties to cooperate effectively to help establish peace of Afgan in Afghanistan. Um, now to Iraq. Um, you stop me whenever you like. Uh, uh, I can go on for a very long time. <laughs> uh, but I think it's important, to, it was important to speak about Afghanistan a little bit more than Iraq because um, you, know, you, you hear less about it than you do about Iraq these days, even if about Iraq you don't hear much about Iraq. Uh, speaking soon after the fall of Baghdad, Mr. Paul Wolfowitz said something to the effect that the U.S. administration had used the weapons of mass destruction's argument for, quote-unquote, bureaucratic reasons. But he did not care to elaborate. Ask why, Mr. Wolfowitz was asked, why North Korea, which did not hide its nuclear ambitions, did not receive the same treatment as Iraq. He said, quote, unquote, North Korea has no oil. <laughs> Mr. Wolfowitz at least did not bother to recite the mantra that the U.S. truly believed that Saddam had terribly threatening weapons of mass destruction and that this was so because of flawed intelligence. I asked the senior official in Washington one day, why they invaded Iraq. He just smiled and said, I quote, well, I'm afraid you are not going to hear more than what you already know. As I know nothing, I still don't know why they invaded Iraq. <laughs> of course, conspiracy theories are, are, are many. So if you put together Mr. Wolfowitz's statements about North Korea and the fact that the US military allowed Baghdad to be looted and did not protect any public or private place except the Ministry of Oil. Nobody touched the Ministry of Oil. Uh, this suggests perhaps that the real reason was indeed oil. The new energy bill recently prepared these past few weeks by the Iraqi government with much input from US and British advisors seemed to give credence to the oil conspiracy theory. There is also the theory that the U.S. wanted military bases in Iraq. And indeed, uh, everybody says in the region that the Americans have already built 14 air bases in Iraq. Other explanations also given post facto were not more convincing than the, the, the uh, weapons of mass destruction legend. Uh, let's examine only the argument that the U.S. is in Iraq to promote democracy as a prelude to the grand new Middle East project. The only way to judge the validity of an argument brought up after the event is by looking at the manner in which it was executed and what results have been achieved. Um, let's consider uh, the Constitution, for example. I heard it described by important people as the most advanced in constitution in the Middle East. But the United Nations and the US Institute of Peace had a totally different view. They agreed that both the process and the substantive end result were profoundly dis disappointing. In fact, the Iraqi constitution is a legal monster and its authors uh, under patient pressure from U.S. Ambassador Khalilzad, agreed before even completing its drafting that it must be revised immediately after the elections. 
Amongst its many oddities, this constitution provides that the national army will not enter any of the 18th provinces without the express prior permission from the local uh, assembly in that province. Uh, elections also with the classical woman holding her ink-tainted finger on the first page of the New York Times is another success of democracy in Iraq. Elections are important on condition that they take place in the right time and in the right sequence in a peace process. This was not the case in, 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 in Iraq. Political parties do exist and that is also part of the uh, achievement. But uh, a friend of mine said that uh, uh, you know, in Iraq and in other places, when you move, uh, you change a, a system of a, a single party regime to multi-parties, what happens very often is that you create several single parties. And I'm afraid this is exactly what has happened in, in Iraq because most of the parties that exist there function exactly like the Ba'ath of Saddam Hussein used to function. And there are many little Saddams waiting to grow up. The son of one of the party leaders is already nicknamed Oday after one of Saddam's two brutal sons because he behaves just like them. When he pro proudly pronounced the dissolution of, the Saddam, uh, of, the, of Saddam's army, Mr. Bremer said that Iraq shall have an army of a maximum of 70,000 troops because it will be at peace with itself and with its neighbors. And of course, the new army, as well as the new police force, will respect human rights and the rule of law. A couple of days ago, I think maybe even yesterday, the spokesman of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad announced that the new security forces in Iraq numbered 330,000 people and more were being trained. We are fast approaching the same numbers of military that Saddam had. The chief of poli police of Basra said publicly sometimes in 2005 that he did not control more than 20 or 25 percent of the force which is supposed to be under his command. The rest, he said, came from militias and they take their orders from and report to the militias. Hence the death squads that you hear about. Hence also the centers of torture discovered in the Ministry of Interior in Baghdad and in a couple of police stations in Basra just a few days ago. And when the British forced their way into these police stations in Basra, and rescued some detainees who were being tortured, Mr. Maliki, the Prime Minister, did not order an inquiry into the abuse committed in the police stations. He protested against the unjustified interference of the British. Finally, there is the war on terror argument. Was Iraq invaded to fight international terror? As I said earlier, Kabul was just a stopover on the way to Baghdad. But let's see the facts. Al-Qaeda had no presence whatsoever in Iraq before the war. There was one group called Ansarul Islam, but they were in the far northeastern corner of Kurdistan. Let me see, I think Do I have a map of uh, Iraq. Up there, in the far corner, uh, east corner of there. And that was part of Kurdistan, which was not controlled by Saddam. This was the only fundamentalist violent group that existed in Iraq before the invasion. Today, the situation is quite different. Some reports estimate that Al-Qaeda may well be stronger in Iraq than it is in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda Iraq is still led by a non-Iraqi, but it has ceased to be a relatively small cell concerned with attracting young Arabs from other countries willing to die as suicide bombers. Al-Qaeda is now an Iraqi faction in its own right, one amongst dozens of others, 
but perhaps one of the most important. I understand that it is, Al-Qaeda is actually running directly some districts, not only in Al-Anbar, but very close to Kabul, to, 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 to Baghdad. Um, furthermore, the invasion of Iraq has literally given a shot in the arm of Al-Qaeda worldwide. You may have read recently that uh, the fundamentalist groups in North Africa have united under the name of Al-Qaeda for the Muslim Maghreb. The governments of our part of the world and, our, and the intellectual elites think that the evol this evolution is directly linked to the situation in Iraq. Far from weakening Al-Qaeda and similar organizations, the invasion and occupation of Iraq have, in the words of two recognized experts, Peter Bergen and Paul Krupchank, quote, increased terrorism sevenfold worldwide. At the end of it all, I still don't know why the United States invaded Iraq. Um, but if it is oil and, and, and uh, uh, military bases, is that worth 3,200 American lives and more in the future, most probably? Is it worth 500, 600, perhaps 700 billion dollars and rising, plus all the moral, political, diplomatic cost to the United States? And last but not least, all this does not take into account the terrible cost of this war to the Iraqi people and nation. As I, earlier, as I said earlier, the debate in the United States and Britain is not about Iraq anymore. And this is the second issue I'd like to say a few things about. If you look carefully at the debate in the Congress, for example, these last few days, you will see that the problems, the problems, the many problems of Iraq are dismissed in two or three sentences, like the US does not wish to be caught in the middle of a civil war. And uh, another thing is, uh, it is up to the Iraqi government to do what it takes to facilitate reconciliation and provide security and protection for its people. There are some very good articles, photographs, and films that give vivid and poignant images of the sufferings inflicted on the Iraqi people, on Iraqis. But the whole picture is often missing. The United States and its allies, I presume, do not, want, do not count the dead amongst the local population. So how many Iraqis have died? Take the figures given for 2006. Is it 12,000, as the uh, Iraqi government said? Or 32,000, as the United Nations has said? Let me tell you that uh, a friend of mine in Baghdad told me that a friend of his, who is a doctor, in one hospital in Baghdad, and there are many, many hospitals in Baghdad, that doctor said that in his hospital alone, he sees about 100 bodies a day in one hospital. Add to this the uh, families who bury their dead without bothering to uh, go to the hospital. And then perhaps the number of 600,000 dead, given I think by Lancet, uh, seems unfortunately very, very plausible. <coughs> Um, how about the material damage suffered by the Iraqi nation? We all remember the looting and destruction of priceless pieces, uh, objects in the museums of Baghdad. That was done by individuals, irresponsible people. Of course, one might ask why the occupation forces allowed the looting to go on for several days. We also know that uh, uh, all, 
some two million Iraqis have taken refuge in neighboring countries, especially Syria and Jordan, while there are now about the same number, two million, internally displaced. One hears very little about minorities, Christians belonging to some of the earliest churches in, in the history of uh, Christianity in the world. Yazidis, Mandanis, others who are the victims of abuse from all sides. And those who found a way to leave have left. What, what, uh, to go back uh, for a moment to the uh, uh, cultural heritage of Iraq and the world, I suppose this is the best place to speak about it. So listen to this. And this is a quote. Another residue of the war of occupation is the intrusion of military facilities on Iraqi cultural sites. Some American facilities have done enormous, occasionally irreparable damage. In one of the tragedies of the American occupation, one of these bases was built on top of the Babylon World Heritage archaeological site. When <coughs> they entered Babylon, American troops turned the site into a base camp, flattening and compressing tracts of ruins as they built a, hel a helicopter pad and fuel stations. The soldiers filled sandbags with archaeological fragments and dug trenches through an, an, an ex, unexcavated areas while tanks crushed slabs of original 2,600 years old paving. Babylon was not the only casualty. The 5,000 year old site of Kish is perhaps the next most damaging. This is from a very little book written by Mr. George McGovern and William Polk. Mr. Mc McGovern and Polk, uh, in this, uh, uh, their, their, their excellent book, is one of the rare publications where there are comprehensive estimates of what this war has done to Iraq and its people. They, for example, estimate the property damage incurred during the invasion and occupation as between 100 billion and 200 billion dollars. Who is responsible for this and who is going to pay for reconstruction? And finally, there is the civil war issue. Mr. Orton Gortzman wrote in December 2006, and I quote, the situation in Iraq is far more complex than the term civil war implies. Attempts to define the several and diverse sources of violence as civil war are not helpful to Iraqi efforts to arrive at political accommodations. I don't, I don't quite understand why calling civil war civil war would make it difficult for the Iraqis to arrive at political accommodations. The sad truth is that Al-Qaeda and extremists among the Shia are fighting a civil war which is becoming more and more vicious. And just as warnings were issued in the case of Afghanistan that the conflict will spill over, there is ample reasons here also to fear that unless the problem is managed and managed fast, this civil war now raging in Iraq shall definitely spill over and may engulf Muslims from India to Lebanon. Countries like Indonesia and East in the East and Morocco in the West should not take it for granted that they will be spared. Um, if I may be personal for a minute, I lived my adult life and political and in a political and cultural environment where issues of race and religion have been completely alien. Uh, it took me 20 years to realize that one of my closest friends in Lebanon was a Christian. And 
I am just now discovering who amongst my Iraqi friends is Shia and who is Sunni. Um, so the story is going around about the historic feud between Sunnis and Shia are highly distorted and exaggerated. There are differences and there are clashes, yes. There are tensions, but more importantly, there are, or rather were, before the invasion of Iraq, extremists on both sides who nourished hostile feelings towards one another. Uh, in Iraq also, these views existed. But I think, if you remember the Iraqi-Iran war, uh, uh, sharp, that, that, that war definitely sharpened these tensions, but the people who, for example, the Shia who sided with Iran, were a very, very, very tiny minority. Hundreds of thousands of Shia fought loyally in the army, within the ranks of the army of their country. True also, the uprising against Saddam Hussein, uh, just after the Kuwait was liberated in 1991, was almost exclusively Shia, and the repression was atrocious that definitely raised the feelings of the Shia community against the regime, not against other Sunnis. Uh, and it did not affect social relations between common people. It did not stop mixed marriages from taking place, and it did not affect the life of the tribes which are mixed. You have in Iraq uh, uh, tribes where the majority is Shia, and the sheikhs of the tribes are Sunni. And the opposite, uh, the majority are Sunni, and the, the, their leaders are Shia. And they, they, they live and they continue to live, to live together. Um, so now, we hear sometimes that Iraq cannot be put together, and in that case, why uh, not break it into three countries? I strongly believe that an alternative to a united Iraq is not three peaceful Iraq. It would be permanent chaos inside Iraq and soon all over the region. And the impor important encouraging thing to see here is that the overwhelming majority of Iraqi Arabs do not want their country to break up. Kurds do want an independent state, but the responsible leaders of Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan, realize that at present and for the foreseeable future, an independent Kurdish state is not possible, or to be precise, the cost may be too high. Um, you know, I've been far too long, but uh, let me just uh, say a few words to finish. Uh, there is a, a tendency in the region and at times in Iraq itself to say, the Americans have broken Iraq. Let them fix it. I recently told a meeting in Dubai, no, it's not like that. It is true that they broke it. But you, the people of the region, inherit it, and you have to fix it. Um, there is much talk about Iran and Syria in the United States. I'm not sure how much influence Syria has, but Iran does have influence. I think that Iran, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, together with the United States, can fix Iraq. Uh, but Iraq alone cannot save itself. The United States cannot save, the, uh, cannot save uh, Iraq uh, anymore. Um, I think I'll stop there, and uh, then perhaps in the questions we can, we can take to them. Lakh Abrahimi will answer one or two questions. We have time for one or two before the reception. Please, Edward. Yes. I just wondered, what's your opinion about the proposals of the voters in the House and Senate, which was last week or two? The proposal of? Proposals voted in the U.S. Congress the last week or two involving beginning with small children. What is your opinion? You know, I'm still a diplomat, and I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to interfere in internal matters of uh, the United States. Um, 
you know, I think what is, what is important is that the people of the United States, and I think their leaders, uh, Congress certainly, and I think in the government more and more, uh, realize that the present policy is not working. Uh, there was this um, report of uh, Baker and Hamilton that, are, that was very, very interesting. There is this meeting that has taken place in Baghdad a few days ago. That wasn't much, but the follow-up can be, can, can be important. Uh, I, I think that if the Americans realize that uh, their policies, you see, what, ha what has been happening until now is that the Americans were telling the rest of the world, come and support our policies. And the rest of the world politely, you know, saying your policy is not working, so we don't want to support it. If today the Americans are saying, please come and let's work out together a new policy for Iraq, I think that people will work with them. Um, uh, about the Taliban, I think common uh, wisdom is that they get their money mainly from drugs. I, I have some doubts about that. I think that drugs finance corruption in Kabul much more than they finance the Taliban. Um, the Taliban get their money from Pakistan. They get their money from, you know, they used to get money from the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. They don't anymore, but I think they have people who, who are, you know, they, have, they have relations with rich people there, some of them of, or, of, of Afghan origin, who are giving them money. And I think they get a lot of money from, from Pakistan as well. Um, the insurgency, I think it's the same thing. I think that they are getting um, you know, some money locally, extortion, kidnappings, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, probably a lot of money that had been put aside by Saddam Hussein precisely for this purpose and is being used now, and also a lot of donations from outside of people who, uh, some people who really share the view of the insurgency, but some people who are just uh, you know, mad at the occupation of Iraq. Can you, can you raise your voice, please? Do you think the recent development in Islamabad is a sort of a seed of truth and affects the relations between the change balance of the power there and the relations with Taliban and some um, I don't think it has a direct relations. That is the, what happened in, in Pakistan. What happened in Pakistan uh, with this problem of the chief justice, isn't it? Uh, which is creating a very serious problem for the for president. I think you'll have to ask Farzana later on. She will explain to you this much better than I can. Uh, but I don't think it has a direct bearing on, 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 the Afghan, uh, on the Afghan situation. What has a direct bearing is, I hope, this visit by uh, Vice President Cheney, um, which indicate that the United States is now uh, taking uh, Afghanistan, what's happening in Afghanistan, more seriously. And, you know, I, I'm wondering whether, uh, you know, realizing that they cannot win in Iraq, uh, and that is where they wanted to have their, uh, you know, legacy, the historical legacy, perhaps they'll go back to Afghanistan and say, and try to save, to salvage what can be salvaged there. I wish you explained that to me. As I told you, I don't understand why. You know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just desperately trying to understand. Um, you know, some of my friends tell me that I'm, I'm being stupidly obsessed with this question, but you know, I, I find it extremely difficult to accept that a country like, you know, the biggest country on earth, um, you know, in, in whatever terms you want, you know, the best brains, the, the the, the, the richest, the most beautiful, whatever you like. That's what the United States is. 
they go into a war like this for no reason. I, I, you know, I, I find it difficult, but there is no reason. I mean, there is no reason that, uh, that satisfies me. Yeah. I think that's been the whole discussion now. Uh,